Good morning. Welcome back. Um, this is our final uh, lecture for the course on Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, today we're going to talk about what uh, contemporary Southerners referred to as the redemption of the South. And, and that is, of course, um, the story of the uh, undoing of uh, Congressional Reconstruction, which we talked about last time, and how uh, white Democratic Southerners regained control of their states. <clears throat> um, so uh, where we had left off, um, radical Republicans um, had uh, really uh, gained control of um, Congress, um, although they were not a majority. Um, they were a minority, but they represented a, a strong um, influence in shaping um, the direction of uh, Congress. They represented a slight minority uh, in the House and a, a, a smaller minority in the Senate. Um, however, um, they uh, exerted a power within the Republican Party um, that worked beyond um, just their numbers. Uh, so um, they, they've been able to establish this military uh, reconstruction pattern across the South, with the South being divided into the five military districts. We talked about the various Reconstruction Acts that were passed last time. But there were, um, nonetheless, uh, by this by this time, uh, with the new uh, 14th Amendment and then eventually um, 15th Amendment being passed, it's looking to a lot of people in the American North um, as though the work of Reconstruction um, might well be done. And there's an increasing uh, pressure from northern uh, financial and industrial elites, excuse me, to sort of move the country um, forward onto other issues now, including um, the development of the American West and uh, you know building of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, capitalizing on the on the growth um, uh, of American industry uh, that began to really accelerate during the Civil War, and, and folks just want to turn. Uh, the nation's political energies now toward uh, national economic development. So let's talk about, um, you know, with that in the background, right, you also have Southerners who are um, obviously resentful of the new sort of place of the freedmen um, politically and socially in the American South, uh, as well as um, they begin to have a uh, an increasingly deeper resentment of Yankee interference uh, in Southern matters uh, with this military occupation and the existence of the Freedmen's Bureau. And then of course, um, the higher taxes now that are gonna be resultant um, in the South. So let's talk Let's talk about those things. And, and let's begin uh, in, if you're in your outline, we're in that final section, part four um, of this, uh, I guess what is actually a four-part series of lectures, although we've only covered uh, three parts um, in this course. Um, so let's begin by talking about uh, the decline of the Republicans uh, in the South. And, and the first matter to take up is the question of taxation. Taxation was a big problem for Southern Reconstruction governments. Um, that is because, first of all, uh, as the Republicans uh, take control of these Southern states, um, they have a need to maintain pre-war services. So whatever um, political services that the states and uh, municipalities provided locally, um, government has an obligation to collect taxes and pay for the provision of those government services. Also, uh, tax dollars are going to be necessary for repaying the war's destruction. There has been, you know, when we talk about reconstruction, one of the things we've tried to do is uh, you know, make everyone aware that Reconstruction didn't just mean there was a physical uh, rebuilding of the South that needed to take place, but we were talking about a social and political Reconstruction. But now let's go back to the physical. Um, there's been a lot of physical damage done to the South and its infrastructure and its economy as a result of the Civil War being fought primarily on Southern soil. So now there's a need not just to maintain pre-war services, but also now to repair the war's physical destruction in the South, which is going to require tax dollars. Then there's the need to be able to stimulate industry in the South. Tax dollars are going to be required to try to stimulate uh, industry that will create jobs. And then um, there is the need for money to support new ventures, such as the school system that are going to be established throughout the South, for example. Um, so there's this 
greatly increased need now for uh, tax revenues on the part of the state governments of the South. However, the war had destroyed much of the Southern tax base. Um, slaves were gone. Um, the act of emancipating the slaves and making slaves freed people, they one of the things that frequently gets missed is they were no longer, it's not just that they were no longer property, they were no longer taxable property. So this put a huge dent um, in Southern state budgets going forward. They don't, that's not taxable revenue anymore. So that disappears from the equation for the Southern states. Then there's property wrecked, other forms of physical uh, property that we were talking about just a minute ago. That has been destroyed. The land itself has been destroyed. The land has lost value because the slaves are no longer uh, there to produce the crops of cotton, which no longer fetch the same prices on overseas markets. So all this um, leads to a um, significant real estate crash um, in the South and in some of the documents um, and essays you just read in chapter 11. Um, that should have been made clear to you, the value of what plantations were being sold for. In one case, I believe there was a, a plantation that had um, been priced at $30,000 uh, value before the war. Someone was trying to sell it for $700 um, in Louisiana. So um, think about what that's doing to um, the tax base of the southern states. Um, and then, of course, you had a lot of property carried off by the Union armies. Uh, you know, looting, and then uh, Confederate stragglers looting. So th the property base um, and tax base of the South has been devastated. And therefore, it makes these new requirements for tax revenues to do the work of reconstruction um, a much more difficult situation for everyone. So in the South, taxes must go up to maintain old services. And then they have to go up even more to pay for the new stuff, the new work of reconstruction. So what this ultimately does at a social level um, is it arouses increasing suspicion of these new Republican governments um, and the Yankees' interference in them. Um, it creates great widespread resentment of the Republicans and these governments, especially among the yeomen, um, the uh, so-called uh, Scalawags, right? And some of them were actually part of this coalition themselves, but now they find themselves um, involved in participation in a party that's raising their own taxes beyond tolerable limits, right? So this hits them, hits them hard as well. These people are actually part of that coalition. Um, another big thing that's going to play into the decline of the Republican Party in the South is corruption, okay? Now, when we speak about the corruption in Reconstruction, and this usually points to the, the quote-unquote carpetbaggers, who were really sort of rank opportunists, who went down to the South to try to capitalize on what was a very fluid um, economic situation down there. Um, opportunities were rife for people to exploit um, what was going on there. Um, it's important to note that this was part of a, a nationwide pattern of corruption. We begin here to enter um, an era of American history known as the Gilded Age, as Mark Twain and uh, Charles Dudley Warner had uh, deemed it. Um, as, uh, it was actually the title of a sort of a novel of cultural criticism that Twain and uh, Warner wrote um, in uh, the early 1870s. And um, there was widespread government and business corruption um, throughout the United States. And in fact, you're uh, in, the, in the Foner book that we're reading in the latter chapters, um, it details that um, quite well, right? So you see that this is going on everywhere. Um, so it's not something that is uh, by any means uh, unique to the South at this point. Nonetheless, this corruption adds another layer of difficulty and mistrust to the work that um, these Republican governments are trying to accomplish. It, it complicates the work of Reconstruction, makes it um, more difficult than it needed to be, right? But, and, and, but of course, you know, politics and government, that's just, uh, you know, corruption always does that, right? But in these very, very um, distressed circumstances, it just made 
uh, made the problems more acute. Okay, another thing um, that is going to uh, work uh, toward Southerners regaining control um, was the emergence of a group called the Ku Klux Klan. Um, the Ku Klux Klan started in uh, Tennessee in 1866, started out as um, ostensibly um, a Confederate veterans club um, that was headed by uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who you would have read about in uh, the McPherson book. He was a retired, um, and I mentioned him in some lectures, he was a, uh, at this point, a retired, they were all retired Confederate officers, right? Uh, Ex-Confederate, um, he had been a Lieutenant General of Cavalry in the Western Theater, um, who developed a very fearsome reputation. Um, so it starts <clears throat> there in Western Tennessee and spreads throughout the South, um, becoming uh, a terrorist organization. Uh, essentially, the um, in the quest to restore the South to white, democratic rule, the uh, Ku Klux Klan essentially operates as a paramilitary wing of uh, the white Southern democracy, um, in much the same way that the IRA operates as a paramilitary arm of um, the, uh, excuse me, of the Sinn Féin, the um, sort of Irish political party. Um, the Ku Klux Klan uh, performed a similar function um, for the Democratic Party of the South. Um, their Activities, which you've read about in, in, our, uh, in our books and documents, their efforts were geared at frustrating uh, Reconstruction policies and governments in their, their efforts, um, and to keep the freedmen um, down politically, to keep them from emerging uh, politically and socially uh, and having an impact on um, the, the shape uh, of Southern states, Southern statehood, right? So, it's, it's really a direct assault on their citizenship. Um, they, uh, their activities really were geared around nighttime violence, right? Uh, pulling people out of their homes in the middle of the night, um, you know, whipping people, beating people, in some cases as hangings, um, harassment, murder. Um, so they, they, they were very much a, a terrorist organization um, as we would uh, classify one today. Their main purpose um, was political, uh, and their target was Republicans, black and white. They were the main targets. People who were involved in the Republican Party project in the American South, which was really um, geared toward um, the elevation of Southern blacks to um, a level of social, legal, and political equality. Um, so anyone involved in that project was a target. Um, the main targets were, again, um, black and white Republicans, school teachers, anyone aiding the freedmen um, in their efforts at achieving, um, again, political, social, economic, uh, legal equality. Um, the, the Klan was very purposeful in its activities. Um, its activities were focused in areas where black, white, um, political coalitions held the majority. Um, and then they would uh, focus their uh, attacks in those geographic areas where the uh, biracial coalitions held political control. They would use their terror uh, to weaken the strength of these coalitions, to break people's will, to participate and make themselves targets. Um, and then the Democrats would regain control of the region and at that point, the Klan would then move on and focus its activities on a different area, again, where the biracial Republican coalitions held control. So it was very targeted, uh, very strategic. It was in no way a sort of randomized hate crime. OK, this was this was, uh, you know, again, these are ex-military officers who are directing this. They, they're, they're, they're purposeful uh, and they're strategic about what they do. Um, no less than one out of 10 black leaders um, who, again, were um, acting as delegates to the state constitutional conventions that were being held in this area during 1867-68 were attacked. So 1867-68, one out of every 10 um, black delegates to state constitutional conventions were attacked. Seven of them uh, died as a result of these attacks. Um, this had far-reaching political implications nationally. 
um, in 1870-71, um, Congress would pass a couple of laws trying to deal with this. Um, they would pass an, um, pass an anti-Klan law and then follow up after that with two enforcement laws. Um, so Congress, you know, went on the you know, sort of legal warpath, so to speak, in 1870 70, 71, trying to clean up uh, the Klan uh, in the American South. Um, the um, some of the provisions of the anti-Klan and Klan laws that were passed uh, were that they made actions by individuals against the civil and political rights of um, other citizens a federal offense. So this was not something that could possibly be tried at a state level. Okay, these it became a federal crime to violate the civil or political rights of another. Um, election supervisors. Um, were posted throughout the South to try to supervise elections and uh, watch out for uh, polling place violence. Um, the Klan laws and the enforcement laws particularly permitted martial law and suspension of the writ of habeas corpus in the South uh, in an effort to combat Klan activities. Um, these laws were prosecuted in some states um, and not in others. They were prosecuted at uh, with different levels of vigor. Okay, um, southern juries would often refuse to convict people who were um, accused of Klan activity. I'll let you dwell on that for a moment and suss out why that might be. Okay, but anyway, in the end, of the excuse me, three thousand three hundred and ten cases brought to federal court um, of people violating these uh, these Klan laws, right? Only 1,143 resulted in conviction. So only one out of three cases uh, of people brought to trial for Klan activity uh, resulted in convictions. Um, but these laws did have their effect in that the Klan officially disbanded. Uh, many Klan members would flee prosecution. Um, so it did have the effect at the time of breaking up the Klan and uh, putting an end to its um, activities. Of course, uh, we would later see a um, resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in 1917, um, many years later. Um, but it would emerge... Uh, on a different footing with different uh, objectives um, and, and operating slightly differently. Okay, but um, the fact that the Klan um, went out of business for a while opened the door for imitator groups to take their place. So what we would see then was the emergence of groups like Red Shirts, uh, the Knights of the White Camellia, and other of uh, these sort of secret societies um, that had the same goals and aims. Um, they were just, uh, you know, terrorists uh, with a different name, right? But, but as far as the Klan, um, it did sort of provide a model uh, for these imitator groups. And even after it went out of uh, uh, business, uh, these groups, particularly the red shirts, became very powerful uh, in uh, places like South Carolina and Mississippi. Um, a third thing uh, that will uh, contribute to the um, undoing of Congressional Reconstruction would be the emergence of the liberal Republicans, the liberal Republicans um, as a group, as, as really a third party group that will emerge during the 1872 presidential election cycle. Um, so who were these liberal Republicans? Um, well, they were Republicans who were tired of Reconstruction policy. These were the people in the Republican Party who thought it was time for the party to move its energies uh, on to other issues, that the, the focus on the American South um, had been the party's focus really since the 1850s, if you think about it, right? Um, the uh, obsession with um, bringing an end to slavery, at least to its westward spread, right? Um, to protecting um, free soil, free labor, free men, as the, as the uh, saying goes. Um, that work um, 
had been done, right? Now, so now the, the shift of the party had gone from um, accomplishing the protection of free labor and um, the emancipation uh, of the freedmen and then the establishment of constitutional amendments to protect them to this ongoing military occupation of the American South, which was very costly um, in terms of tax dollars. Um, and, and a continuous focus of the party's energy on Southern matters to the exclusion of Northern and Western matters. And there were just folks who had, uh, you know, sort of reconstruction fatigue, uh, if you will. So they were tired of reconstruction policy and they actually bolt the Republican party and form a new party. And they nominate Horace Greeley, um, uh, he of uh, New York Tribune fame, um, as their presidential candidate in 1872 to run against Ulysses S. Grant, who was then seeking re-election to a second term. So who were the liberal Republicans more specifically? Well, it was really kind of a mixed bag group. It included um, low tariff men, people who wanted to see um, a lowering of the tariff and more of a, a free trade policy. Um, you had civil service reformers, of course, um, going back to um, what you may have learned about the Gilded Age, either in um, U.S. History II um, or in uh, Professor Epstein's uh, Gilded Age uh, course, if you've taken that. Um, the questions of civil service reform, the eventual uh, passage of the Pendleton Act in 1883, but this was very much an 1870s issue, this idea of a meritocratic um, uh, systems for people getting government jobs, right? The, the bloat in the national um, uh, government had become huge, and uh, it was typically uh, jobs being given out or even created uh, just to reward people for political favors. And uh, people, unqualified people and corrupt people just occupying uh, taxpayer-funded positions. Glad we don't have anything like that today. Um, so we have these civil service reformers, people who are just sick of corruption. So again, um, it was it was very much a um, a party full of people focused on 1870s issues. Okay? All of these people have two things in common, whether they are tired of reconstruction, whether they're low tariff people, whether they're uh, folks bent on civil service reform, they all have two basic things in common. The first of all is they disagree with federal intervention in the South. Okay, These are people who uh, come with a laissez-faire mindset, smaller government, less government hands-on, right? Less government intervention. Uh, you know, recall that throughout Boner's text, what he's talking about um, on and on is the emergence of what he refers to as the activist state, this bigger, more powerful federal government um, than America had seen before this time. And a lot of people are not comfortable with it, right? Um, the second thing is, these are people who, who again, they're laissez-faire. They wish to see, quote unquote, market forces and the most qualified men deciding events, right? So whether it's um, deciding what's going to go on in the South, whether it's deciding what's going to go on in Washington, D.C. in terms of national policy, they want to see sort of market for market forces and qualified individuals, again, and that's a market-based competitive issue, determining things, okay? Um, not just government. So it's a combination of kind of laissez-faire, principles and political reform that um, they're bringing in their campaign. Now, they're going to do pretty well in the election because a lot of Democrats are going to give their votes to Greeley. Um, a lot of them see that the Democratic Party does not have a chance of defeating uh, Grant, and they want to bring the Republican Party down in its power. So a lot of Democrats are going to vote for Greeley. Not enough people vote for Greeley to beat Grant in 72, but enough people vote for Greeley to scare Grant and scare the Republicans. Okay? Um, it, it, the results are such that uh, kind of like the, um, the failed effort of uh, Fremont in 56, if you will, didn't defeat the Democrats that year, but put a scare into them. Right? Uh, so Grant at this point is very leery about antagonizing white Southerners any further, many of whom, uh, ha who had, of course, voted for Greeley, right? Um, with elections, midterm elections in 1874, 
And then again, um, in 1876, there will be another presidential election. Grant now begins to tread very lightly in the South. So even when um, eru election violence erupts in Mississippi in 1875, and there's some, um, as a result of political terrorism by the red shirt group that I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, and the, the reconstruction governor of uh, Mississippi at that time was a guy named uh, Adelbert Ames. He was, I believe he had, must have been uh, elevated to the uh, level of general at that point because you had to be at least a brigadier to be a military governor. But Adelbert Ames was sending um, desperate um, uh, telegraphs to Washington begging Grant to send troops to help subdue uh, the troubles being uh, created by the red shirt groups um, around uh, the fall elections there in Mississippi in that year. Um, and Ames to have sent the telegraph would tell you that was a real problem because this was a guy who had, um, for those of you to rewind uh, back to our Civil War time a little bit, Adelbert Ames was the colonel of the 20th Maine Regiment um, from whom Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain took command. So uh, that regiment had um, taken part in one of the failed uh, attacks at Fredericksburg, right, assaulting Marie's Heights. He had led that charge with his guys come under that kind of fire. So this was not a guy who, um, who was a coward, right? Um, so it tells you that if it got to the point where he was writing the president saying, I need more troops, I need help, that it was a pretty dire situation. But Grant refused um, Ames's pleas for federal troops at this time. And he had actually been advised by um, Governor John Sherman of Ohio um, not to do this. Uh, Sherman, a moderate Republican and the brother of Grant's friend, William Tecumseh Sherman, um, there was a real fear that the Republican Party was going to lose Ohio, um, which was has always been a sort of a, what we call a swing state. And there was a real, real um, worry that the, the Republicans were going to lose control of Ohio. Uh, so this played a key role in Grant's decision not to um, support uh, Ames. And of course, um, Democrats would, would be very successful then in these 1875 elections. Um, in his second term also, Grant, um, several of his cabinet members get caught up in scandals um, throughout, uh, again, the Gilded Age was a period of uh, political corruption uh, in the United States. A number of Grant's cabinet members were caught up in these scandals. And this further undermined confidence in Grant when he supported them publicly. Um, now, Grant was a soldier. Grant uh, understood loyalty. He understood loyalty much better than he understood politics. Um, so uh, he was not used to this kind of uh, behavior from his uh, staff uh, when he was an officer. And he expected that his uh, cabinet would, would sort of act accordingly. Um, so Grant really not in a corrupt way supported these guys, but actually rather naively uh, believing in them, uh, stood up for them. And uh, this would further uh, tarnish, really actually tarnish quite badly his, his political reputation um, and um, undermine confidence in his uh, second term uh, as president. Um, again, the, the, the showing of the um, liberal Republicans in 72 had put the scare in him. Uh, there was fear that uh, Democrats were going to be able to uh, begin to gain political control. We see this happening in the South, as I mentioned, in places like Mississippi. But in 1874, during those um, midterm elections, the Democrats actually will recapture the House of Representatives. And, you know, of course, then uh, that means they gain uh, control of one House of Congress, the one that originates much legislation, uh, and they can actually now uh, act in an obstructionist sort of way on Reconstruction policy. So this really begins weakening the legislature's power over, quote unquote, Southern issues, right? And it's going to really grind the work of the radical Republicans to a halt. Um, also, um, an amnesty act 
had been passed in 1872. This had pardoned most rebels, um, and it prevented all but 500 of the very top um, ex-Confederate officials from holding political office, uh, either in the South or nationally. So the combination of this Amnesty Act in 1872, which uh, allowed for a greater number of ex-Confederate officials and officers to get into politics, and then the Democratic recapturing of the House in 1874, really signal um, the shifting winds uh, with respect to um, the future of an ongoing government backing of Reconstruction in the South. And then the last piece um, of, of the puzzle really if we look at, if we're just going to, you know, I mean, we can obviously get uh, much more granular and looking looking at other uh, more finite pieces, but just looking at sort of the big pieces of what um, lead to this. Um, the last would be the um, election of 1876, and then what will follow the, the compromise of 1877. So let's talk first about the election of 1876. Um, this was a presidential election year. Um, it had become obvious um, at that point that the people of the North would no longer support uh, an ongoing uh, federal obsession, federal financing, uh, federal military presence um, in the South. In other words, the Northern people weren't going to be behind Reconstruction any longer. Uh, the radical Republicans had lost control of the party. The moderates have become the dominant force. Um, uh, I mean, Obviously, uh, the loss of the House of Representatives in 1874 made clear uh, that the Northern public no longer supported Reconstruction. So the 1876 election becomes a contest between Samuel J. Tilden, uh, the Democratic governor of New York, and Rutherford B. Hayes, um, the Republican from Ohio. Uh, Hayes, like so many um, <laughs> in the... Uh, post-Civil War era was a general, former Union Army general uh, from Ohio. Um, and and a, a, a fairly moderate guy, right? So Tilden does extremely well in the South. Um, he, he, you know, again, even though he's a New Yorker, um, I mean, this will not be the case as, you know, for Al Smith in 1928, but this New Yorker does very well uh, in the South here. Uh, in 1876. Um, he needs only one electoral vote to defeat Hayes, but there are 19 disputed electoral votes. Uh, those votes are from Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina. These are all unredeemed states. In other words, these are all states where um, the Southern Democratic Party has not regained control, and they are still held by uh, biracial Republican coalition. So it is in these three states where we have 19 disputed electoral votes. And we have one electoral vote from Oregon that is undecided on a technicality. Now, this is uh, really, uh, if you were around and, and, uh, for the 2000 election, or if you are able to go back and study the 2000 election, um, at that time, there were uh, just, you know, slew of comparisons being drawn to the 1876 elections, because this is exactly what happened again in 2000 in the election between uh, Al Gore and George W. Bush, um, where in all the disputed electoral votes and ballots uh, came from the exact same states. It was, it was just crazy coincidence. So, uh, Anyway, this was the, the, the first go round uh, for these states being uh, in the middle of a controversy uh, in a presidential election. So, of course, as in 2000, both, sorry, both sides were charging each other with election fraud and both sides were claiming victory. Um, and at that time in 76, the Constitution offered no guidelines for such a problem. So there was really no, no roadmap to follow of uh, what do we do in this situation here? So Congress establishes a 15-member commission with seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and one independent. And the independent, uh, they chose uh, Supreme Court Justice David Davis uh, to uh, fill that seat. However, Davis um, refused his appointment so he could accept um, a Senate seat. Uh, 
uh, that he had just won. So the commission, uh, the government replaces him with a regular Republican. So now the Republicans have an eight to seven um, advantage on the commission. And so now they begin recounting all the ballots. And as in 2000, um, they win every recount on strict party line. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many recounts of votes happened in 2000. It's pretty crazy. Um, so anyway, they recount the votes time and time again. And every time um, when they vote on the results of the recount, the Republicans come out ahead eight to seven. So as it stood, if Congress accepted the results of the commission's findings, Rutherford B. Hayes would become the 19th president of the United States. That brings us to um, the last uh, chapter here, the Compromise of 1877. Congress's acceptance of the committee's results was not a cinch, okay? Um, because Democrats still controlled the House of Representatives. Um, they uh, could use a filibuster to um, kill any vote on the results of the commission. So they had that power. So just because a committee decided that this was going to be the result, it didn't mean uh, Democrats in Congress were going to accept it by any stretch of the imagination. So it reached the point that many Americans believed that uh, a crisis could start and it could possibly be another civil war uh, over um, this election and its result. In fact, many Southerners had taken up the cry of Tilden or fight. Um, so this is kind of interesting that uh, you know, Southern uh, Southerners were ready to uh, go to war to make sure a New Yorker uh, was elected president. Um, anyway, a solution was ultimately worked out. Um, this is your classic 19th century backroom political deal, right? They, they, they made a deal in a cigar filled, uh, you know, room full of whiskey tumblers and, you know, ceiling fans turning slow and cigar smoke everywhere and in a back room of a Washington hotel. That's where the, that's where the deal got cut. Um, the result was that Democrats agreed to accept uh, Hayes's election to the presidency. Republicans in return promised economic aid to the South in the form of um, federal financial assistance in railroad construction and other uh, internal improvement projects, as well as um, a guaranteed number of federal patronage posts um, for, you know, customs officer, postmaster, and, and such um, in the South. But the last, and, and I guess the, the biggest, uh, aside from Hayes becoming president, um, ultimately, this probably had the longer term effect in American history than Hayes himself did. Federal troops were removed from Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina. So with Republican um, uh, agreement to remove troops from Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina from uh, the South, bring those troops back north or send them out west. This ended the military occupation of the South and Reconstruction was over. On a side note, Rutherford B. Hayes um, was inaugurated privately inside the White House because of the fear of a possible assassination attempt. So um, this was, you know, a really sort of, um, really sort of controversial, mixed up um, election in 1876 um, that, uh, you know, to, to the degree that the president had to hide in the house uh, to get inaugurated. So, um, that's it for lectures for this course. Um, we'll wrap up, uh, you know, the reading this week, and uh, we'll have a review session uh, next week to go over uh, any questions you have about readings, lectures, uh, or uh, sort of content for the final uh, comprehensive essay. Okay, so be safe out there, and thanks for listening.